The thing that strikes me most as we are coming to the conclusion of 2021 and about to embark on 2022 is just how much we're going to see public policy impact our personal lives, our home lives, our work lives, everything that really matters, I guess. Things that are outside of just the political arguments in the Beltway, at the Capitol, on cable news. We the people are going to feel public policy in perhaps a way that we have never before in 2022. And I know that this sounds, by the way, let me just interrupt myself. I know that this sounds like a very negative prediction from 2022, but it's it's actually not. It's actually not. And let me start by saying, even before we get to 2022, I think we're already, we the American people are already feeling the repercussions of Biden's public policy. Even at Christmas, I went back to Ohio for Christmas with my husband and my daughter. We visited my parents. All Most of my sisters were in town. Um, my sister's husband, my brother, my brother's girlfriend. And we could even feel public policy impacts around our own Christmas tree on Christmas morning. And we're not, we're not, by the way, a family who typically talks about politics on Christmas morning, but you could, you could feel politics pervading. Not only did my husband recently lose his job due to the vaccine mandates coming from public health officials, but there was a gift that my brother-in-law created for my mom. It was actually this really cool product that so it's supposed to help you be prepared for, I don't know, it's not exactly the apocalypse. It's kind of prepping stuff. It's basically a bucket of food and resources should the grid go out, should there be a shortage of necessities. And the interest that my parents had in this gift this year was very different than I'd ever seen them be interested in a similar sort of product. And why is that? Well, it's because we don't we don't believe in the supply chain. We don't trust the supply chain being run by the Biden administration anymore. We don't trust the different industries that have suffered this enormous burden because of quote unquote critical staff shortages which is just a euphemism for people who have lost their job. They've either quit or been fired due to vaccine mandates or industries like the restaurant industry, which has been decimated by social distancing rules and vaccine rules and mask rules, et cetera, et cetera. You can see the mindset of the American people in, like I said, my own parents. I've seen this change in their mindset because of how they responded to this gift from my brother-in-law. They loved it and they think it's necessary. I mean, you can see this. You can see this around your own Christmas tree. I actually um, gave one of my family members an IOU because the gift that I had ordered for him, and keep in mind, I do my Christmas shopping right around Thanksgiving, uh, maybe beginning of December. I'm pretty good on being on top of Christmas shopping because I don't like the stress of it when I'm running behind. So I ordered it very early and it didn't arrive in time. How long has it been since you would order something online? And I ordered it through Amazon. It was a book. I ordered it through Amazon. It's a book and it didn't arrive on time. It didn't arrive in time for Christmas. It didn't arrive until actually after we left Ohio. Then it showed up on my parents' front porch. We see the impacts of the supply chain crisis. The same thing happened actually with a couple of other, my younger sister's gift to me did not arrive in time. We see these issues with the supply chain starting to hit home, starting to impact us. Now, I know it's already been impacting us. We've seen this at the gas. At, we've seen this when we're filling up our gas tanks. We've seen this when you're buying diapers. You've seen the cost of meat, et cetera, et cetera. But it's starting to hit home even for gifts. And this, by the way, was Kamala Harris's prediction a long time ago. They knew, the Biden administration knew this was coming, the supply chain crisis, and they did not do what they needed to do to fix it. So we're feeling, we're feeling this, this, pressure. We're feeling these repercussions from Biden's public policy, and it's not even 2022 yet. It's also, by the way, probably why the Let's Go Brandon magnets that my husband got for my brother and my brother-in-law to put on the back of their truck, why it was such a wild hit. Because people are fed up with the Biden administration. It is hurting them. It is hurting their families. It is hurting us, even when we're around the Christmas tree. And uh, again, this is not a negative prediction for 2022, so stay with me, but it's going to get even worse in 2022. That's what we're going to talk about today. I'm Liz Wheeler. This is The Liz Wheeler Show. So I thought it would be both fun and hopefully educational. Hopefully it would be informative. If we talked about what we can expect in 2022, because isn't that what we all think? We sort of, at the end of each year, we reflect on the past year and we think about what's going to happen the next year. I mean, my sisters and I always make predictions on who's going to get engaged, who's going to get married, who's going to have a baby, you know, not, not amongst ourselves, but, you know, people that we know. And it's fun to think about what's going to happen, but it's also good to think about 
the less positive things that might happen to prepare yourself. So I thought we should do that about 2022. What what can we expect to see politically? But first, I want to talk to you about Moink Box. So unfortunately, I was upstaged this year giving my husband Christmas gifts because I actually got him some really cool stuff too, but I didn't stand a chance to begin with because just a day or two before Christmas, our Moink Box arrived and he opened this thing up. And the first thing, the first piece of meat that he pulled out was this enormous steak. And as I said, I didn't stand a chance after that because he was absolutely delighted. You know I'm vegan. You know he's not vegan. So you should take his word for it that it's delicious. As you know, Moink delivers grass-fed and grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and wild-caught Alaskan salmon direct to your door. This helps family farms become financially independent outside of big agriculture, which we like. Their animals are raised outdoors, their fish swim wild in the ocean, and moink meat is free of antibiotics, hormones, sugar, and all the other junk you find prepackaged in the meat aisle. So sign up at moinkbox.com slash Liz to get a year of free filet mignon, and then pick which meats you want delivered with your first box. You can change what you get each month, you can cancel any time. Join the moink movement today. Go to moinkbox.com slash Liz right now, and listeners to this show get free filet mignon for a year. That's one year of free filet mignon but for a limited time. It's spelled M-O-I-N-K box.com slash Liz. That's moinkbox.com slash Liz. What can we expect to see politically in 2022? And I think the number one thing that we can expect to see is the radical left. And when I say the radical left, I'm no longer, of course, talking about just the fringe of the left. I'm talking about the radical left, which has infiltrated, hijacked, and completely overtaken the entire Democratic Party, and most progressive activists that I've ever seen, so and the mainstream media, we're going to see the radical left continue to deny reality. That's what we've seen. I mean, we saw that in 2021. We saw that, you know, think about the University of Pennsylvania transgender swimmer. Leah Thomas, this person, has um, picked as a name. His name was Will Thomas um, before he embarked on this transition. And, and, and Leah Thomas is decimating her biologically female competition, as we all know. And yet the left and the mainstream media, they just deny reality. They deny the objective truth that men and women are different, that men cannot become women just because they identify as a woman, just because they suffer from gender dysphoria, and that it's fundamentally unfair and unjust for a biological male to compete against biological females. That's why we already had a separation of sexes in sports, why there's women's sports and men's sports, because everyone acknowledges, or did until recently, that men and women are different. It's unfair for men and women to compete against each other. We're going to see this continue, not just in not just in the area of transgenderism or the gender spectrum, as the left calls it. We're going to see this in other areas. And An area I think, this is a prediction that I'm going to make for 2022, an area I think that is going to receive some of the thickest denial of reality is actually obesity. Now, bear with me for a second. I know this is a really sensitive topic for a lot of people, and, you know, perhaps as it should be, there's nothing wrong with it being a sensitive topic, but I saw a card that looks like a business card. It went viral on Instagram, and this card is intended for patients to hand to a healthcare provider when they go in for any kind of healthcare, whether it's an urgent care, whether it's your primary care doctor, a specialist, you hand this to your doctor. Like I said, it looks like a business card. I wanna show this on the screen because on the front of this card, it says, please don't weigh me unless it's really medically necessary. If you need, if you really need my weight, please tell me why so that I can give you my informed consent. Then you turn this card over and on the back of the business card, it says, why? Because, Most health conditions can be addressed without knowing my weight. When you focus on my weight, I get stressed, and that's not healthy. Weighing me every time I come in for an appointment and talking about my weight like it's a problem perpetuates weight stigma, a known and serious health risk, and I pursue healthy behaviors regardless of my weight status, see health at every size. So that phrase right there, health at every size, it's abbreviated H-A-E-S, haze. And you're going to start to notice, in my opinion, This is my prediction. You're going to start to notice this H-A-E-S, this health at every size, becoming a very pervasive narrative throughout our healthcare system in the coming year. It's this idea that obese people don't suffer health problems simply because they're obese, that you can somehow separate weight from other health problems, and that it's a politically incorrect thing for healthcare providers. We're talking about you go to your doctor, and patients don't want their doctor to tell them that obesity is intricately tied to all of the leading causes of death in our nation, whether that's heart disease, whether that's stroke, whether that's diabetes, whether it's cancer, obesity is intricately tied to all of these things. 
40% of the US population is obese. Obesity accounts for several million deaths around the world every year. Of course, obesity is a health risk. And it is, it is tied to not just these deadly fatal health conditions, it's tied to almost every serious health problem. And I'm not being hyperbolic here. I mean, think about it. Like I said, heart disease. How many people die of heart disease every year? It's over 600,000, right? Well, the leading cause of heart disease is being obese. Think about diabetes. Think about an emergency room, by the way. Think about all the narratives that we're hearing right now about these overcrowded emergency rooms. And the left and the mainstream media are blaming COVID patients. But think about who is actually on a regular basis filling up emergency rooms. It's obese people who are going there for emergency care because of conditions that are either caused, exacerbated, worsened by the fact, their choice that they're obese. Now, I don't say this with any kind of disrespect towards the obese people themselves. Of course not. You know, why would I? This isn't a commentary on whether they're beautiful. This isn't a commentary on their humanity. This isn't a commentary on whether they're a child of God. None of that. But it is objective reality to acknowledge that obesity is a serious health risk, that it costs, I think, 147 or $148 billion to our healthcare system. That's how much we pay in our healthcare system for obesity-related medical care every year. So this idea that the left has that they will deny the reality that obesity has anything to do with health and that it causes or exacerbates serious health conditions, deadly health conditions, I predict in 2022 that we are going to see a continuation of the denial of reality, this denial of objective truth that the left has began or has begun with, um, and maybe they started with gender, they started with transgenderism. I think it's going to morph into obesity. And one of the reasons, probably, probably one of the reasons that they're going to target obesity is because they know that the, I think it's the second, the second biggest predictor of COVID fatality, or at least COVID hospitalization after age, is obesity. That's the second biggest factor as it relates to whether you're going to be severely ill, needing hospitalization, or dying of COVID-19 after age. And the Democrats on the left and the mainstream media and the public health apparatus have denied this for two years now. For two years now, they have ignored the epidemic of obesity in our country and how that epidemic of obesity has fed into the COVID-19 virus. And so they're going to have to double down on this. Otherwise, they will have to admit that they've been wrong for the last two years and they, wouldn't, they won't do that whatsoever. In fact, this denial of reality doesn't just apply to obesity. I was thinking about, you know how right now it seems like the Omicron variant is super prevalent? I was saying to my husband when we were traveling home, I was looking at Twitter and it seems like everybody that I know and everybody that I follow has COVID right now. And thank goodness, most of them say that it's pretty mild. Maybe they feel crappy for a day or two, but they're over it. They're, it sweeps through their families and they're good. This is unvaccinated people, vaccinated people alike. It doesn't seem to be discriminating. It doesn't seem, by the way, the virus doesn't seem to be checking your vaccine card before uh, they gain entry to your establishment if you will allow me that, that terrible pun. Um, but I was thinking, I said to my husband, I wonder, or don't you wonder, shouldn't we all wonder how many lives could have been saved in the last two years if Dr. Fauci, specifically Dr. Fauci, because he is the, he is the leading voice on COVID policy. So Dr. Fauci specifically, although of course the entire public health and medical fields should have done the same. But if Dr. Fauci had recommended, you know, exercise and weight loss and reducing sugar and no processed foods and vitamin C and vitamin D and zinc and repurposing existing medications. Yes, like hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin and the z pack that becomes that, um, that, that three Z triple whammy, if you will, of the antibiotic, the antiviral, and the zinc that studies show, I know this is unpopular and big tech won't let me say this on big tech, but has been shown to reduce hospitalizations and death. You know, iodine, nasal rinses, and stopping smoking, and monoclonal antibodies, just this idea that there are therapeutics that we have that we know can reduce the severity of this virus that can, if administered early on, can reduce hospitalizations and fatalities. And you have to wonder how many lives would have been saved if Dr. Fauci had focused on this approach, not trying to stop the virus 
from sweeping through people. You can't stop a virus. We know that by now. But trying to reduce not the number of people who contract the virus, but the severity of the virus once someone has it. Instead of just focusing on the vaccine. You, ha you have to wonder this. And honestly, it's not even just a hypothetical question from me. There is a doctor, there's actually multiple doctors, but the one I want to mention today, his name is Dr. Harvey Risch. He's a professor of epidemiology at Yale. He estimates, I kid you not, that 80 to 85% of COVID fatalities in the US could have been avoided if by March or April or May of 2020, Dr. Fauci had actually looked at the data Yes, even the anecdotal evidence from frontline doctors and put together and recommended and pushed and publicized a regimen of therapeutics for early treatment of COVID-19 instead, of in instead of waiting until people were so sick that they couldn't breathe and then hospitalizing them and putting them on vents and hoping for the best. 80 to 85% of fatalities, Dr. Harvey Risch says, could have been avoided had Dr. Fauci focused on this. And so again, this denial of reality that the, de that the left and the Democrats and the mainstream media have made almost their thesis of the last year is going to get even worse, especially, especially, especially when it comes to COVID going forward. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. But first, I want to talk to you about stamps.com. If you are looking for ways to skip the trip to the post office and dodge all that hectic holiday shopping traffic, why not save time and money with stamps.com? Stamps.com lets you compare rates, print labels, and access exclusive discounts on UPS and USPS services all year long. Here at Soundfront, we use Stamps.com to do business on the road, to save time and money. It just makes sense, especially if your business sends more mail and packages during the holidays. Whether you're selling online or running an office or a side hustle, Stamps.com can save you so much time, money, and stress during the holidays and get discounts on post office and UPS shipping services without making the trip. Discounts that you can't find anywhere else, like up to 40% off USPS rates and 76% off UPS. Going to the post office, to be honest, instead of using Stamps.com, is kind of like taking the stairs instead of the elevator. So if you spend more than a few minutes a week dealing with mail and shipping, Stamps.com is a lifesaver. So save time and money this holiday season with Stamps.com. Sign up with promo code Liz for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, free postage, and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code Liz. So in regards to COVID, and I guess not the virus itself, but our government officials, our politicians, and their actions in response to COVID, it's not even in response anymore. It's really just using COVID as an excuse for the policies that they wanted to implement anyway. My prediction for 2022 is we are going to see more draconian lockdowns. We are going to see politicians smacking down on our rights, on our liberties, on our freedoms, using COVID-19 as an excuse. And my prediction is that Dr. Anthony Fauci, I don't know this for certain, but it certainly seems that he is pushing hard. He's pushing heavily, probably more so behind the scenes even than he is on TV. And on TV, he's mentioned it numerous times for a vaccine passport for domestic travel. But it, before I show you this clip, listen very carefully to Dr. Fauci's justification. So not only does he support a vaccine passport for domestic travel, so you would have to prove that you're vaccinated to get on a plane. That's egregious enough. But listen to his reason why. Take a listen. Let me ask you about something else uh, from from the president's interview with with David. Uh, the, the David asked uh, about uh, the vaccine, the lack of a vaccine requirement for air travel. There is no vaccine requirement for domestic air travel in the United States. Um, and and when the president was asked, should there be one, he said that his team has has said it's not necessary uh, at this point. Do, do you agree with that? That, that? that there shouldn't be a vaccine requirement for domestic air travel. Well, it depends on what you want to use it for. I mean, vaccine requirements for people coming in from other countries is to prevent newly infected people from getting into the country. A vaccine requirement for a person getting on the plane is just another level of getting people to have a mechanism that would spur them to get vaccinated. <laughs> Namely, you can't get on a plane unless you're vaccinated, which is just another one of the ways of getting requirements, whatever that might be. So, I mean, anything that could get um, people more vaccinated would be welcome. Did you notice that he did not use the word safety? He did not use the word transmission. He did not cite a single study. He did not talk about 
um, a soup, it being a super spreader situation inside an airplane. No, 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 no. This is not about science and Dr. Fauci admitted it. He said it's a mechanism, a mechanism to make it difficult for people to travel unvaccinated. It's a mechanism, essentially, this is paraphrasing, of course, to force people to get vaccinated. It's a political ploy. Dr. Fauci is recommending a vaccine passport for domestic travel, and he's not even pretending it's about your health or anybody's safety. He admits it's about politics and that he wants to use the power of the government. He wants to use the executive branch, the presidency of the United States, to make your life difficult if you don't comply with what they believe is the medical treatment that they want you to get. That to me is more shocking. I expect stupid policy from Dr. Fauci. I expect him not to acknowledge that air travel is actually pretty safe and you have a choice whether you wanna travel or not if you wanna take that risk. No, no, I expect that. But to hear from his mouth that he admits, even on cable television to the American people that it's just a political ploy, that is, it's, it's so draconian. It's so draconian that I have to predict that we're gonna see more of this kind of stuff in 2022. I also think we're gonna see the definition of what fully vaccinated means change. Um, it's already changed a little bit, but I don't think in the legal sense that it has been changed in meaning in New York or San Francisco or Philadelphia or Chicago or Washington DC or any of these places that have a vaccine mandate. I don't believe that they're counting boosters in the definition of fully vaccinated, you can correct me if I'm wrong or if there's been an update since in the last hour <laughs> since I checked here, but I think we're going to see the definition change and I think it's going to change more than once. That's my actual prediction. I think we're going to see it change, the definition change more than once. I don't think by the end of 2022 that fully vaccinated is going to mean two jabs. I don't think it's gonna be three jabs. I think it's going to be at least four jabs. I also think that we are going to start to see in 2022, and again, these are the negative predictions, just wait until you get to the positive ones. I think we're going to see politicians at the state level canceling more elective surgeries in the name of COVID. And I think we're going to start to see the terrible, tragic repercussions of that because you can't cancel surgeries related to cancer. You can't cancel diagnostic surgery. You can't cancel orthopedic surgeries indefinitely without these conditions getting worse. And for some of those conditions, worse means more likely to be fatal. And we have now had two years of politicians off and on delaying or canceling surgeries that they deem unilaterally, these politicians deem not necessary for your health and well-being. And I think we're going to start to see not only more canceled surgeries, elective surgeries, but I think we're gonna to start to see some of the repercussions of that. Um, I think we're also going to see an incredible backlash against the public school system, not even as it relates to critical race theory, actually. Not, not, even, uh, not even racialism and Marxism. I think we're gonna see an incredible backlash against school systems that continue to mask children, that have vaccine mandates against children, and that social distance children, maybe they have the kids. Did you see that story about the kids that were forced to eat outside in like 30 or 40 degree weather? Social distance, sitting apart from each other. These are like kindergartners. We're gonna see incredible backlash because the Surgeon General even admits at this point that there is a, a mental health crisis in young people caused. Now they'll blame it on COVID, the virus, as if all of these public policies that kids have been subjected to were the fault of the virus and not the politicians. They'll blame it on the virus, but it's really the fault of the government officials who have imposed these horrible, horrible things on our nation's children. Jan Crawford at CBS, at CBS actually said that she thinks the damage to children in 2021 is the media's most underreported story. And take a listen to this. Yeah, you have to hear, hear it for yourself. Well, I want to get to underreported stories uh, as well. Jan? Oh, I, for me, I mean, I, my kids hear me rant about this every day, so I may as well tell you guys. It's, it's the crushing impact that our COVID policies have had on young kids and children. Mm -hmm. uh, the, by far, you know, the least serious risk for serious illness uh, but I mean, even teenagers, you know, a healthy teenager has a one in a million chance of getting and, di and dying from COVID, which is way lower than, you know, dying in a car wreck on a road trip. Uh, but they have suffered and sacrificed the most, especially kids in underrepresented at risk communities. And now we have the Surgeon General saying there's a mental health crisis mm -hmm. among our kids. Uh, the risk of suicide, girl suicide attempts among girls now up 51% this year. Uh, black kids 
uh, nearly twice as likely as, as white kids to die by suicide. I mean, school closures, lockdowns, cancellation of sports. You couldn't even go on a playground in the D.C. area uh, without cops scurrying, uh, getting, shooing the kids off. Tremendous negative impact on kids, and it's been an afterthought. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's hurt their dreams, their future, learning loss, risk of abuse, their mental health. And now with our knowledge, our vaccines, uh, if our policies don't reflect a more measured and reasonable approach for our children, mm -hmm. they will be paying for our generation's decisions uh, the rest of their lives. It, it's hard to even listen to that. It's hard to even hear that without getting infuriated. And you don't have to be a Republican. You don't have to be a conservative. I mean, you are a parent, period. Liberal, conservative, Republican, Democrat, independent, none of the above. That's going to infuriate you. It's going to infuriate you to remember that your children weren't allowed to play at playgrounds. They weren't allowed to go outside. They weren't allowed to go to soccer practice. That they're told, they're taught to look at other children as if those children are germs, they're masks, their IQs are going to be degraded because of these policies from politicians who just want to exact power over the people. It's, it's absolutely infuriating. And by the way, the other thing, we're going to see some serious data manipulation in 2022 because even according to the New York Times, vaccine mandates across our country have not boosted in any significant way the rate of people getting vaccinated. So vaccine mandates have not actually done what, you know, Biden or, you know, a statewide official claims that they are intended to do. In, but instead, instead of boosting vaccine or vaccination rates, 50,000 people are out of their jobs across the country due to these vaccine mandates. People who've quit because they have objections and their objections uh, their employers refuse to accommodate their objections or people who have been fired in the healthcare industry. I mean, we are going to see headlines across the country in the coming months about critical staffing shortages at hospitals. Critical staffing shortages, we're going to be told, are the reason that these ICUs are overflowing, that these ERs have long wait times. But what we're not going to be told is that these critical staffing shortages are a result of vaccine mandates, not COVID the virus, Vaccine mandates that caused healthcare workers to quit or be fired, that is the reason for the critical staffing shortage. I mean, look at Massachusetts, for example. In Massachusetts, they're actually bringing military medical providers into the state. At the same time, literally two weeks ago, I was talking with you about a story of a hospital in Massachusetts that fired 500 healthcare workers who declined to get the COVID-19 vaccine. So we're already seeing this. We are going to see more of this in 2022. And part of this backlash, by the way, against public schools that have hurt children, that have caused this mental health crisis in children, part of this backlash is going to be an even greater divide among the between the radical left and parents. Like I said, it doesn't have to be conservative parents. When it comes to who is in charge of their children, do parents have any say? And the radical left is going to ratchet up their attacks. This is what I predict for 2022. They are going to ratchet up their attacks against parents specifically, parents having any, any voice over their child's educational experience, and specifically, they're going to attack parental rights and homeschooling. We're going to talk about that in just a second, but first I want to talk to you about American Hartford Gold. I'm sure I'm not the only one who's noticed everything is getting expensive. We are in the biggest economic crisis since 2008 with a government that's printing trillions and trillions of dollars. Consumer prices are the highest we've seen in 30 years. Inflation is certainly seems to be here to stay. And if the government continues its out of control printing and spending, the dollar could continue its free fall and lose its coveted role as the world reserve currency. So how do you protect your money, your retirement, your savings? Well, American Hartford Gold can show you how to hedge your hard-earned savings against inflation by helping you diversify a portion of your portfolio into physical gold and silver. They'll even help you move your IRA, your existing IRA or 401k, out of the volatile stock market into a precious metals IRA. And they make it easy. They are the highest rated firm in the country with an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau and thousands of satisfied clients. And if you call them right now, they will give you up to $1,500 of free silver on your first qualifying order. So don't wait. Call them now. Call 855-768-1883. That's 855-768-1883. Or text Liz to 65532. Again, that's 855-768-1883. Or text Liz to 65532. So in 2022, I predict that the radical left is going to recalibrate their attack on 
the public school system. I know that we are in the midst of this fight against critical race theory, this racialized Marxism that the left is completely committed to. That's going to continue. But I predict in 2022, the attack on parental rights specifically. And parental rights can be this philosophical idea that parents obviously have dominion over their children because they are their children versus children being belonging to the states, being wards of the states. And I think the left is going to be more open, more bold, more audacious about their opinion that children do not belong to parents, that children belong to the state, that the state has ownership over children. And one of the reasons that I think that they're gonna ratchet this up is we see this rhetoric beginning. Nicole Hannah-Jones, the author of the 1619 Project, who admitted that what she wrote, part the premise of what she wrote was false and that she didn't intend it to be history, even though it's packaged like that. She admitted that she doesn't think parents, white parents specifically, should have any role in determining what their children are taught in school. Take a listen to this, it's really disturbing. I don't really understand this idea that parents should decide what's being taught. I'm not a professional educator. I don't have a degree in social studies or science. We send our children to school because we want them to be taught by people who have an expertise in the subject area. And that is not my job. When the, when the uh, governor or, or the candidate said that he didn't think parents should be, be deciding what's being taught in school, he was panned for that. But but that's just the fact. Um, this is why we send our children to school and don't homeschool, because these are the professional educators who have the expertise to teach social studies, to teach history, to right. teach science, to teach literature. And I think we should leave that to the educators. Nicole Hannah-Jones tried to clarify what she was talking about and actually made it worse. She clarified on Twitter that she meant white parents shouldn't decide curriculum. And I think that's worse because not only is that the, the premise of what she's talking about, that parents in general shouldn't have any say over their children's educational curriculum, over what they're being taught, over what's being poured into their minds, what kind of people they're being formed into. She doesn't think parents should have any rights. She thinks the state, there's already that divide. And now she's bringing in an element of racialism. White parents specifically shouldn't have any say. White people shouldn't be allowed to have any role in deciding what their children learn in school. This is so disgusting. But mark my words, what, have I, what do I always say? I say, listen to what the left says. We conservatives must listen to their words and we must believe what they're saying because what they're saying now will come to fruition down the road. And then we'll look back and say, oh, why didn't we believe them when they told us this is what they were going to do? So in 2022, look for attacks on parental rights specifically to ratchet up. And also in 2022, look for attacks on homeschooling. So, so, so many millions of parents across the country have taken their children out of public schools because of critical race theory, because of Marxism, because of transgenderism, because of attacks on Christianity, because of anti-American sentiment, because of revisionist history like the 1619 Project or Howard Zinn, um, because of all of this poisonous ideology that's being poured into our children's minds and compounding that, compound that with the COVID protocols, compound that with the idea that children are forced to mask and social distance and there's Zoom school and teachers are afraid and it's all tied up into politics and people that are hurt are the kids. Millions of parents have decided to homeschool their children, which is wonderful. There's so many great resources for parents to do this. Most parents are able to do this. You're capable of doing it. You don't have to be a college professor to teach children. There's curriculum designed for homeschooling families written by these so-called experts that allow you to simply administer it to your child without having to know all of the facts and figures uh, yourself. Homeschooling is a wonderful option. Homeschool kids turn out almost by every measure to have a more superior education than public school, even private school kids. Parents across the country are realizing this. So expect in 2022 attacks against homeschooling. Expect states to try to stealthily pass laws that require certain curricula to be taught by homeschooling parents to their children that allow the state to snoop on homeschooling families under the guise of so-called safety checks that make it difficult for parents who are not licensed teachers to teach their children that force oversight by the public school district of what your child is doing in school expect attacks on homeschooling and expect it not only on the practical level expect it on a philosophical level. People like Elizabeth Bartholet at Harvard are already trying to paint homeschooling as being inherently abusive just because of what it is. Not because children might be abused at public school or private school or homeschool. It's not even her argument. She's not even arguing that homeschooling uh, creates a situation that makes it more likely that children are abused. That's not statistically accurate anyway, but that's not even her argument. 
Her argument that is that homeschooling itself, meaning children being so-called, quote unquote, deprived of a public school education is abuse in and of itself. And that parents shouldn't have the right to instill their values and their principles and their religion, their faith, their politics in their children, that just doing that is abusive. So expect the practical and the philosophical attacks on homeschooling to, to ramp up in 2022. And if we're aware of it, if we expect it, if we acknowledge it, we listen to it and we believe it, then we can stop it. So this is all pretty pretty dark stuff that we're talking about. We're talking about what to expect from the enemy. The enemy being Marxism, communism, socialism, radical leftist ideology, powerful government officials, whether they're elected, whether they're unelected bureaucrats. We're talking about what to expect to preserve and protect our freedom, our liberty, our system of justice, our family, our our inherent God-given rights. Now, now that we understand what we're facing, Expect in 2022, these are my predictions for 2022, remember, expect the Republican Party, expect the GOP to sweep Congress in 2022. We don't want to count on this. We don't want to count our chickens before they're hatched. But my prediction is that the Republican Party will take back not only the Senate, they will take back the House of Representatives. Remember, we already have, statistically speaking, a good chance of taking back, um, of taking back the House of Representatives because listen to this fact, since World War II, the party of the president, in this case, that would be Biden, obviously, a Democrat, loses an average of 25 plus House seats in the president's first midterm election. So statistically speaking, in the last 80 years, the party of the president has lost more than 25 seats in the House during the first midterm elections. Well, 2022 is the first midterm elections of Biden. The opposite party of Biden is the Republican Party. So we can expect the Republican Party, statistically, they have a high likelihood of gaining at least 25 seats. Well, in order to take back the House of Representatives, they only need five seats. Republicans just need five seats to take back the House of Representatives, and they need one seat to claim the Senate. So we have a pretty good chance to begin with, but compound this with this enthusiasm. I haven't seen enthusiasm from Republicans, this fighting spirit against COVID tyranny and these attacks on public schools since the Tea Party, since the Tea Party movement. What was that, 2010? There is a Tea Party-like enthusiasm among the conservative movement right now that I think is going to lead to the American people saying enough, enough to the radical leftist ideology, enough to Democrat politicians who don't care about the people, enough to Republican swishes who don't have the backbone to fight for what's right, don't have the fighting spirit to identify and expose corruption and hold corrupt people accountable enough. I predict that at the end of 2022, we will be in a very different political position because I believe at the end of 2022, yes, Joe Biden will still be president, but Republicans will control the House and the Senate, which will make a very big difference in whether Biden is effective or ineffective in implementing his strategy. So that that's the, that's the positive uptick on identifying what I think will happen or what we can expect in 2022. I also think on a practical level, there's going to be some crossover from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party because of all the violence that we're seeing in Democrat-run cities across our country. That, again, is not just a Republican is issue. It doesn't matter if you're conservative or liberal, Democrat or Republican, it matters when the safety and security of your family and your town and your business, where you live, your neighborhood, your workplace isn't safe. You know, if you're living in San Francisco and you can't even go into the drugstore because the drugstore is closed because there's been looting that hasn't been prosecuted. They're, they're essentially just robbers going in and taking merchandise. There's car break-ins all the time. In Chicago, there's shootings. These cities run by Democrats who have refused to prosecute crime, who have refused to enforce the laws, and it's created this atmosphere like a third world country, this anarchy, this criminality. People care about that. Democrats care about that. Liberals care about that. Even woke people care about that when they are the ones who aren't safe. And so I think one thing that we can expect too in 2022 is this part is actually going to get worse now, Biden, Biden may, you know, ratchet up his rhetoric calling for law and order. But what we're going to see is we're going to see that it's going to be very difficult because we're going to see fewer people signing up to be police officers. Fewer people are going to want to be law enforcement 
because of what happens to law enforcement. Take the Kim Potter trial. I watched the Kim Potter trial um, when I was home at my parents for Christmas and Kim Potter was found, she's a police officer in Minnesota who accidentally killed Dante Wright. She intended to draw her taser. She yelled, I'm gonna tase you, I'm gonna tase you. She, in reality, she drew her firearm and shot him and killed him. She was found guilty of first degree manslaughter and second degree manslaughter. First degree manslaughter requires that you are committing a crime at the same time, this, this unintentional death happens during the commission of another crime. Second degree manslaughter is criminal negligence. At most, at most, Kim Potter should have been convicted of criminal negligence, but there was also no details, no, no statute that describes the elements of criminal negligence in a way that makes it discernible from a horrible tragic accident. So Kim Potter should not have been found guilty of either of these two charges, and yet she was. She was found guilty on both charges. She faces probably more than 15 years in prison for a horrible accident that was politicized. It was racialized because Kim Potter is white and Dante Wright is black. Obviously, obviously ignored during this whole thing, ignored dur during the mainstream media's narrative on this was the fact that Dante Wright, after Kim Potter pulled him over, he was trying to escape. He was trying to drive away. He was resisting arrest. And while he was resisting arrest and driving away, he put another officer in danger, another officer who was half in the car. That's why Kim Potter actually drew her weapon to begin with, because she feared for the safety of her fellow officer and was trying to stop that. If that's not justified, if a police officer, for making an admittedly horrible mistake, no one's trying to justify that or excuse that or talk, or talk her way out of it, not at all. It's a horrible, tragic mistake, and she shouldn't be a police officer ever again. She maybe even shouldn't be allowed to own a firearm. But to put her in jail, to put her in prison for 15 years after she served almost 30 honorable as a police officer and had this atrocious accident, to have her treated like a criminal, why would anybody want to be a police officer if this is what happens to police officers, if this is how police are treated? This is going to be one of the pivotal issues in my opinion, my prediction in the 2022 midterms, not even the presidential election of 2024, this is going to be a pivotal issue in the midterm elections is police safety and what's happening in our cities because people across the board care about this. They really care about this and they might not be looking for ideology. They're looking from our politicians, our elected officials for who's going to keep their cities safe. Mark my words. Those are my predictions for 2022. So this is our last show of 2021. And it's kind of hard to believe, to be honest, that not only is 2021 over, but that we have come this far. We started this show, we started our show this year. And my goodness, it has been a whirlwind. And I just want to thank you. Sincerely, I want to thank you for following me to The Liz Wheeler Show. I want to thank you for your loyalty. I want to thank you for making this show a success because you're really the one who has made it what it is. It's been absolutely astounding, the number of messages that I've received, the number of views that we get every day, the number of downloads, just this incredible following, this community that we've built together is all due to you. So thank you. It's been, it is uh, we're having the time of our lives. I'm having the time of my life doing this with you. So thank you for that. This is, by the way, since this is a holiday week, this is a little bit of a short week. We're just gonna have this episode, but we do have a ton of content going up every day, including this week over on Locals. So for example, um, I just interviewed Michael Knowles. There's a sit down where we argue about the definition of liberty and what government's role is in protecting that. Um, I also just posted a pretty hilarious and awkward family Christmas story um, we're reading together over on Locals, Robert Kennedy Jr.'s book, The Real Anthony, Anthony Fauci. Crazy book, by the way, really worth reading. Um, all, kinds of, all kinds of good stuff will be going up on Locals this week. If uh, you wanna join us, lizwheelershow.com slash Locals. We do, we have extended our sale, by the way. If you want to become an annual supporter of the Liz Wheeler Show community, you can do so for just $56 a year through January 15th. That's lizwheelershow.com slash Locals. Again, Thank you so much for supporting this show, for being part of the Liz Wheeler Show community on Locals. And, you know, here's to 2022. Let's keep it up. Our VIP, our Locals VIP of the week, by the way, is J.D. Erico or J. Derrico. Welcome to the Liz Wheeler Show community. We're delighted to have you. Introduce yourself so we can all get to know you. Tell us where you're from, what issue means the most to you, your predictions for 2022 politically. We'd love to talk to you and get to know you more. Um, on that note, like I said, Liz Wheeler Show community, 
or lizwheelershow.com slash locals. Um, we'll have new content going up there all week. And have a happy new year. Have a safe new year. And I will talk to you in 2022. The Liz Wheeler Show is produced by Jonathan Hay. Executive producer, Chad Abbott. Director of photography, Kevin McRoberts. Editor, Alejandro Figuerilla. Sound mixer, Robin Fenderson. Director of marketing, Emily Washler. Production and talent coordinator, Matt Toffler. And senior publicist, Patricia Jackson. This has been a Soundfront production. Ready, give this video a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button below, and ring the bell to make sure you never miss a video.